the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. Come on, stand to your feet and let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor, how good it is to be in the house of the Lord. We're just a grateful people as we come before you right now, Father, and lift our hearts to you. Here's our hearts. Fill it with your way. Fill it with your word, your want, your desire. And we'll give you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. Father, all the churches that are meeting on this Wednesday night all over the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're our brothers and our sisters, and we just love them, Lord. We ask you to bless them as you would bless us. Bless our Baptist brothers, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary chapels in Harvest, Oak Valley, and Oasis, and Inland Christian Center. Thank you for the Assemblies of God, Foursquare Denomination. We thank for our Adventist brothers and sisters, Catholic brothers and sisters, Emmanuel, Ecclesia, Trinity, Lord. We thank you for the Way Church. We thank you for San Bernardino Temple. We ask you to bless them as you would bless us this day. And God will give you the praise, give you the glory. Because you know why, Lord? Because we're not here to build man's kingdom. We're not here to build a single church. We're here to build your church, and it's everywhere. And we just thank you, Father, that the kingdom of God is expanding in the inland empire as well as around the planet. In Jesus' mighty name, we're a grateful people. Everybody say amen. amen. Controlling the carnal mind is the subject of this message tonight. It's part number four for those of you that didn't get part number three or two or one. Uh, because you're new with us tonight, I'll, I'll just review just for a few moments so that you can all catch on. All of us have a carnal mind. Getting rid of it, someday you will get rid of it. When you die and when you go to heaven, you will get rid of your carnal mind. In the meantime, God gives us insight on how to control it so it doesn't control you. And let me explain quickly what the word carnal mind means. It's when you make decisions. It's when you get directions. It's when your life is based on what you feel, what you think, what you, people tell you, what your flesh says to you. And you gather all the information in life and you come up with a conclusion in life based on your thinking and your feeling. That's called the flesh it's called the members of your body. It's called the body. And when you do that, you're out of sync with God. And I don't care, and the Bible doesn't either, what you produce in your life, it will never be pleasing to God. Just, just you might as well hear that. Don't care if you had a billion dollars and you made it on your own without God and you gave every bit of it away to some philanthropical organization and did something it will never be pleasing to God because not God is not looking for somebody who can do it on their own, but looking for somebody who's smart enough to do it with God. Adam and Eve, if you'll remember, go back to the beginning. Of, remember this part number four, back to part number one. We find Adam and Eve themselves making a decision in their, if you will, free will choice to choose to partake of that which God told them not to partake of, the tree of knowledge of good and of evil in the midst of the garden. He said, you can have everything else, don't touch that. And sure enough, they come along and they touch that. Why? Because they made the choice themselves to do something other than what's God. From that moment on, man, you and I, humans, have found ourselves in a place where we make decisions based on the tree of knowledge, good and evil. What that means now, instead of doing things the way God tells you to do it and God directs you to do it and God inspires you to do for the results that God has for you, we now do things and get our directions, our decision-making process from our own self, separate from God. And when you do that, God's not looking for someone to be productive in themselves He's looking for someone to be productive with him to accomplish the goals and plan that God has. It's an amazing understanding of the word of God. For an example, 
someone comes to Jesus and says, good master. And he says, why do you call me good? And he comes along and he says, there's none good but God. Now the guy said the right thing, but he didn't understand what he was saying. And Jesus comes and corrects him and says, there's none good but God. Where did that guy get his understanding about what was good and what was bad, what was right, what was wrong? He got that understanding from the tree of knowledge of good and of evil. So his idea of good is different than God's idea of good. When your children come home and they've been hanging around the wrong people and they say this as teenagers to you, well, I, we haven't done anything wrong. These people are good. Good according to society and social systems. Good according to man's philosophies and ideologies. Good according to what we think instead of what God says is completely different. God is not looking for something good. He's looking for something godly. And the difference is not good as we determine what's good based on our society, our social system, our economics. That's not what's good. You know, the majority of people vote something in and they can say that's the law of the land, but it may be the law of the land, but it's not the law of God. And you're called to live above that not to break that, but you're called also to live in the things of God. What's good is what God says. And God's not looking for you to be good. God's looking for you to be godly. So you can be good according to society and socialism, make your decision-making process, get your directions in life, make the choices that you're going to make in life based on your flesh, how you feel, what people are doing, saying around you, what you've learned all of your life, and still be out of sync with God to the place where God can't bless you. God wants to bring you to a place where God can bless you. Why? Because if God blesses you when you're out of sync with God, listen to me now, when God blesses you, if he blesses you when you're out of sync with God, you'll stay out of sync with God thinking you're in the right track so you got to get to the place where God would have you to be we've been looking at this and we found out a, if you will about ourselves we found out we're a three-part people let me give you an illustration of that um, I'm not taking you yet to uh, first Thessalonians but I'll take you to Romans the eighth chapter in verse number five of the eighth chapter eighth chapter of Romans verse number five for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Did you get that? So in other words, if I'm going to live according to the flesh instead of the spirit, I'm going to have to set my mind on the things of the flesh. Notice what it says. But those who live according to the spirits, really the reference here is set their minds on the things of the spirit. Now, verse number six comes along and it makes this statement. Did I, do I have you in verse number six or not? There he is. For to be carnally minded is death. In other words, if I make my decisions, but I have my process, I process everything. How I treat my kids, what kind of decision I make, where to go, what to do. Uh, all my choices in life made by the flesh. In other words, what I feel or what I am myself without God determined to be right. The flesh is death. But to be spiritually, notice the word minded. Everybody say the word minded. The, uh, everybody say the word minded. To, to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And let me tell you something right now. Let's be honest with every single one of you in here. I don't care who you are. You're looking for life and peace. You don't want to live and exist on this planet without the life of God. And you don't want to live in a, uh, living as if you're cursed and you have no peace at all. You work hard for it every single day of your life, and life and peace comes from God when you are, no, not carnally minded, but when you are what? Spiritually minded. So what we found out is that you are a three-part person in order to understand how this all works so that we can control the carnal mind and live in the spirit which brings us life instead of that flesh that brings us death. We had to find out something about who we are, how this works. 1 Thessalonians 5th chapter, verse number 23. I'm not going to put it up on the overhead for you because I don't even know if they have it, but they have it, they can pop it up. But nevertheless, it says that you are a three-part person, body, soul, and spirit. So you are made up of three parts. Body, that's the flesh. No doubt about it, man. You're in the flesh. There's no doubt about it. I'm in the flesh. I will be until the eastern sky splits and Jesus comes and gets me. I'm in the flesh. First part, flesh. 
The second part is the spirit. We're in the spirit. We have a spiritual being on the inside of us when we receive Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. And then we find ourselves in the soul, that we're soulish people. That's, and if we break this down into three parts, body, soul, and spirit. Body being the flesh, the soul being the mind, and the spirit being, if you will, the Holy Spirit dwells inside of you. That works together with your heart and your human spirit. So I make that very clear to you, body, soul, and spirit. We also found out something that when any two of them work together, it voids out the power of the third. So for an example, let me give you an illustration if I may. If the body, the flesh, carnality, or worldliness, my feelings, my feelings work together, listen to this, with my thinking process, my mind, will, and emotion, my soul, it voids out all the power of the spirit. Uh, give you an illustration. Let me give you a simple illustration. Have you ever, I don't know, maybe you've never done this. Maybe it's just me that's done this. You've never done this. I, I just use myself as an exhaust. I'll be laying in bed sometime. I'm ready to go to sleep. And I'll say, man, I just feel like eating something. <laughs> and I, I, uh, I just, you know, what am I feeling? I'm not hungry. I'm just not hungry. I don't want to, and I'm just not hungry. And, and then I'll think about it a little bit more. My, my mind up on top, my soul, my emotions now working with my flesh isn't very long, even though I know, what am I doing? This is stupid, eating this late at night. I don't, I just feel, is, am I the only one that's ever done that? <laughs> Have you ever had an apple pie in the refrigerator and it calls to you? You know the sucker talks. It's in, uh, how about Rocky Road ice cream? Do you know what I'm talking about? It's in the fridge, man. It's, it is doing what? It's talking to you. Have you ever wondered where it talks? It talks into your soulish realm. And your body gets going and you start to think about it for a while and very long before you've eaten the... <laughs> Does anybody know what I'm talking about? And, and the half a gallon... Forget it, man. Has anybody killed off like a half, a half a gallon at one time? I bought Debbie a half a gallon of pistachio just this morning. I was at the store. She loves pistachio green ice cream. I mean, just the color of it just turns me off, you know. And, and so I bought it. So I came home this afternoon. Now, that was this morning. Came home this afternoon. She found it in the freezer. And, man, 25, 30% of that sucker was gone. That was totally left side. But I don't care. It was fun, though, wasn't it, Mama? <laughs> you had a good time. And so it's hard. So anytime the body and the soul work together, it voids out the power of the spirit. So you might want to do something spiritually, but you never do it spiritually. Like, I know I'm not going to eat this. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. But then again, the same thing that takes place. If the spirit works with the soul, it'll void out the power of the body. So here we see the exact opposite. Now, the question is, how does that work? How does the Spirit of God that's on the inside of me, the Spirit of God's always going to flow by what the Word of God has to say. So when my mind is not fixed on the taste of Rocky Road, but my mind is fixed on I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me, it doesn't taste as good, oh, but it's better for me. And therefore, now my mind is concentrating on, on, so here's the battleground. The battleground is for whoever has control of the, of the mind. I mean, the soul, the will, the emotion. That's what I'm talking about. The battleground is in your head most of the time. Now watch this. You say, well, Pastor Jim, then why doesn't the spirit and the flesh just work together? Remember Galatians 5.17. Galatians 5.17 says they're contrary to one another. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. They don't work together. Notice what it says. For they're contrary to one another. What for? They're, they're, they're opposite. They reflect. They're like north and south magnets that repel each other. They just can't work together. Now, what's, what happens? And what happens when north and south work together? They push against each other. So that you do not do the things that you wish. So when you try to get your flesh and the spirit worked in there, the key to this is not get your flesh and your spirit both working together. The key to this is get your mind and your spirit working together. And you keep it there and you get rid of what the flesh says and the, what God says becomes the biggest. Now you're walking in the spirit. And when you walk in the spirit is life and peace. Is anybody listening? 
So let's take a look at this and understand it, all, all of it together. Oh, there it is. So here's your, your choices. And this is the black battleground for every single one of us every day of our life. Whether you have a marriage that you're fighting, whether you're mad at your husband, whether you're disappointed with your wife, whether your kids are bugging you, your boss you can't stand, the guy flipped you off at the freeway, whatever it is, and now you want to get up to him and flip him off. I, I understand all of that, you know, and you have a big flip-off session on the freeway, and then everybody gets off the freeway before someone stops and beats a snot out of everybody. And so all of a sudden, what happens? That's all left side, body and soul working together that brings death. Death brings it starts out with your thinking when your sins and lusts are entertained. James tells us, first chapter, it brings forth death. But when the soul is working together, your mind, will, and emotions, you're casting down imaginations from the flesh, you're not entertaining those thoughts and those passions and those desires from the flesh, and your soul is working with what the Word of God has to say, you find yourself in life. And life is just great. It brings light and love and hope and faith and you know, just everything, everything you want to do. And then you live a life that's full of life and you live a life that's full of peace. Let's check it out a little bit more. It's kind of interesting. Let's go back to uh, Genesis, third chapter. Is anybody with me tonight? And let's, t let's take a look at a few more verses before we go on to the verses that I want to take you to, just kind of setting a foundation we haven't set before. I want you to notice, here's the serpent coming to Eve and he says to Eve, you know, as God said, you can't eat of the fruit. She says, oh, yeah, we can eat of the fruit of the garden. It's just a tree of the midst of the garden. He says, when we do, we'll die. He says, certain says, yeah, you, you won't die. You'll become like God, being able to discern what's good and what's evil. You'll be, you know, uh, you'll understand things, okay? Verse 6 is really interesting. Now, he's just made this, Satan's made this presentation, the serpents made the presentation to the woman to break away from the things of God. Okay, watch verse 6. Listen to this. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for the food, for food, and that it was pleasant to the eye, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, well, wait a minute. What in the world is she doing? God said, don't trust, touch the tree. At that moment, you will die. The serpent comes along and says, wait a minute. You know, you won't die. You'll be like God. You'll be able to discern what's good and of evil. You'll be able to make choices for yourself instead of following God's choice. You'll make, yeah, you make your choices. <laughs> so what does she do? Instead of staying with God, casting down what that serpent had said to her, she starts to meditate it. Look at verse 6 again. It's pleasant to the eye. Where did that come from? She had to see it and acknowledge that it looked good. Number two, uh, the tree was desirable to make one wise. She had to realize the tree had potential to take her somewhere just like the Satan said. So all of a sudden what she's doing, then she took the fruit and ate and she gave it to her husband and he ate and, and, and listen, how sad is the whole thing? All because she made a choice to go after the soul. The soul, instead of getting rid of the thought, which was contrary to the ways of God, she starts to think about it. Oh, it looks good. Oh, it's desirable. I think I'll try it. Yeah, man. Let me tell you something. The things that will be presented to you from your flesh always feel and look good. Get ready for it. But listen, none good but God. And God's not looking for good, he's looking for godly. So the things your flesh will present to you will always look good, feel good, taste good, see good. Mm, man, that's good, but it's wrong because God said it's wrong. Are you following me? So what she did is she got her mind, her soul, working with her flesh, her body, and brought death to Adam and Eve, which was spread on to all mankind. Does anybody follow me? Listen, let me give you a, a little prophetic word. This is a word for somebody. You came here tonight to hear from God. Isaiah 43. This is for somebody. I don't know who it is. Don't even have to jump up and say it's for you. Just shut up and listen to it. Isaiah 43, 
verse number 18. Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Stop right there. God just told you to stop thinking about where you came from, what you were. Do not remember. Is that a mind process? That is a function of your mind, the soul. Do not remember. That's a function of your mind. The former things, where you came from, what you did, all your failures of your past. Now he comes along and says, nor consider the things of, consider the word consider means another mental functioning. Consider means I'm going to meditate. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to think about it. Now I got my soul thinking about where I came from instead of listening to this. Verse number 19, pop it up. Watch this. Verse number 19. And it says, behold, I, I do a new thing now, and it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and a river in the desert. In other words, God says, I'm going to open up a way for you, but you got to get your mind off the past and get your mind on the things of God. I don't know who that's for, but just to say that's for me and write it down and put it to memory, it'd be good. Let's go to the New Testament and see some real truths in the New Testament. Go with me to Colossians. As Paul writes to the church at Colossae. And he writes this in the third chapter. If you're in your Bible, go with me to Colossians in the third chapter, verse number one. And it says, if then you were raised with Christ. What he means by that is if then you were raised with Christ. If you're really saved. That's what he's really saying. If you're really saved, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. In other words, if you're really saved, you ought to be seeking after the things of God. That's quite obvious. But verse number two comes along. Listen to what he writes in verse number two. Set your minds on the things above. Wait a minute. Set your minds on the things above. See, what we do is got our minds so set on the things of the flesh and of the world and the economy and the problems and the wife and the husband and the set, we got our mind, you got your minds out there and your flesh is backing it up and it won't be long before you're in sin. Sin brings forth death. Here he comes along and uses the expression, set your minds. Uh, you know when you, anybody got a car when you touch a little knob on the, you know, the, oftentimes on the little turn thing, you know, if you twist it, it puts it in a certain gear, it activates something. What's it called? Cruise control, overdrive. You're 100 years old. They haven't had that since the 1950s. Uh, cruise control. Thank you, Cindy. We know you're 25. The cruise control. Chaplain Doug is 107. Uh, and Cruise control. If you got cruise control, means you set the speed. You set the speed, and it, you can just sit back, man, take your foot off the gas, have a good time, ripping down the freeway at 89. <laughs> and it stays at 89. You know what I'm talking about? Why? Because you set it. You set it. And if you set something, that's the way it is. So God says, set your mind on the things above and not on the things of the earth. Verse number three, he says this, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Yeah. Kind of cool, huh? Yeah. Just go forward a little bit in your Bible to Philippians. All we're talking about now is the battle for your mind. Notice how everything is about where you put your mind. If you put your mind on what the flesh is telling you, it won't be long before you're into the flesh. If you get your mind off of the stuff the flesh is telling you, get it on the things of God, which is the spirit. Now you're going to do life and you're going to get blessed. The fourth chapter of Philippians. Verse number eight. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble... Whatever things are just and whatever things are pure and whatever things are lovely and whatever things are good report. If there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Set your mind. Set your mind. You're in the middle of a fight with somebody. You've got to set your mind on things of God, not the problem that's before you. 
someone's attacking you, you got to set your mind on things of God or you will attack back. I mean, I've always wondered how Jesus could make a statement if someone slaps you on one side, turn your cheek. I, I'm being a man, that just doesn't work for me. You know what I'm saying? I said, I want to tear that part out of the Bible. Slap me on one side, I'm going to knock you out, sucker. Then I'll pray for you to get raised from the dead. But that's not the way it is. If I attacked, if there's abuse coming at me, instead of thinking about the abuse and what I could do to retaliate, I walk in instant forgiveness. Now that's the side that's the right side. And I'm in this place where my mind is set on the things of God instead of the garbage that's coming at me, whatever it is, now I'm going to start walking in the spirit instead of in the flesh. It's that simple. Does anybody listen? David finds his lowest part of his life in 1 Samuel 30th chapter, verse 6. He is absolutely, for about two or three chapters, has nothing to do with God whatsoever. This is great David. He uh, hasn't become king yet. He's running for his life from Saul. Uh, he's finally had it. He's had years and years and years. It was prophesied he was going to be a king, and now he's been running for his life. And he finds himself in a place where he is absolutely down and out in a, a city called Ziglag, which was part of Goliath's hometown is not too far from Ziglag. And the king over Ziglag was the king uh, uh, Achish, who was absolutely a Goliath's head man. And he finds himself in Ziglag, and here in Ziglag, he comes to an all-time low in his life. He's lost everything. That the raiders have came in, they've stolen the children, they've stolen their money, they've stolen everything from there. He comes back to the camp and all, everything's gone. And David is so down. He's, I mean, the guys are thinking his own men are wanting to stone him. And the Bible makes this statement that David strengthened himself in the Lord. Now, wait a minute. David, you got to get this. David strengthen himself in the Lord. Now, in order for you to understand this, don't just say amen to me because that's a good thing to understand. We do not know how to strengthen ourselves in the Lord. So for me to say to you, you know, when times are down and you feel like just dying, the world is on you, and you just have been away from God and the pressures are on you, you've got to strengthen yourself in the Lord. And everybody says, yes, amen. And you don't know how to do it, and let's admit it. And that's the problem in the churches oftentimes is we tell people what to do without telling them how to do it. Yes, you should strengthen your, the Bible says he strengthened himself in the Lord. Strengthen himself in the Lord. How in the world did he do it? Here's how he did it, and I'll prove it to you in just a moment. His mind got off of himself and off of his losses and got back on God. Finally, after two or three chapters, he gets off of his flesh and gets on God. And you have got to take your mind and get it back on God. It's the only way you'll ever draw the strength that you need from God. As long as your mind is following your flesh, you'll never hear from the Spirit. Is anybody listening to me? Now look, in fact, let me show you that if I may. Ephesians, the sixth chapter. Is anybody listening to me? We're going to conclude with this. This is a great chapter. So Ephesians, go back forward a little bit more in your Bible just to little bit, go to the 6th chapter, verse number 10. Now God is talking to the church at Ephesus through the writings of Paul. So this is really the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And it's penned for thousands of years so you and I can learn what it is on how to live life so that we can have life and peace. Is that okay? And he makes a statement for us that is a bold, blunt statement. Not just out of the blue. But something that is absolutely amazing. I've heard it taught a million times. I've never heard it taught the way you're going to hear it taught tonight. But it's so true for every one of us. Verse number 10 of the 6th chapter says, Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Can I ask you a question? How did David strengthen himself in the Lord? How do you, when God gives you a commandment, what, now, let's, first of all, let's understand something. God wouldn't tell you to be strong if you were already strong. 
God wouldn't tell you to be strong in the Lord if, if you were already strong in the Lord. He tells you to do something. Why? Because oftentimes we humans go back and rely on the tree of knowledge of good and of evil to make the directions and decisions and make choices in our life. That weakens us. So now God comes along and says, be strong in the Lord. And the power of his might. And all of a sudden, now I'm faced with something. Okay, I hear what you're saying, God. But how in the world do I do that? Could I have page 15 up again? That's how. When I get off of the flesh and directions and decisions by the flesh and what the world says and what I think and what politicians tell me and what the economy says and what my parents said and what everybody else dictates life ought to be like and I get on what God says and I meditate what God says, now I become strong in the power of his might. In fact, Paul says these words, I will not be ashamed of the gospel. It is the power to get me to where I need to be. And I need to get off of myself and get on to the power of his mind. I need to every day strengthen myself. This time in verse number 11, he makes a statement. Put on the whole armor of God. Could I have a question for you? I mean, we've read that. We've heard it taught a million times. If you're going to be Christian, you've got to put on the whole armor of God. In fact, he not only says in verse number 11, he also says it again in verse number 13. He says this uh, in verse number, therefore, take the whole armor of God. He tells you to do it twice in three verses. How in the world do I put on the armor of God? What the heck does that mean? I mean, I'm faced with a reality here. I'm losing my home or I'm job. I don't have any money. My family's breaking up. My kids acting like idiots. What am I going to do? I don't feel like I'm anything. I feel like I'm a loser. I go to church and I feel guilty all the time. I don't even feel like everybody else. Everybody else is shouting and praising God. I feel like saying, God, where are you? And how in the world is it? And then somebody comes along and says, put on the whole armor of God. Hey, that's cool. <laughs> like, what am I going to do? What does that mean? How do I, as a human being that's got pressures in their life, strengthen myself in God and put on the whole armor of God in the midst of a problem? Page 15. I can stay left side or right side. That's how I get my strength. That's how I put on his armor. It's all about what am I meditating? What am I putting in my mind? What am I thinking about over and over? Has anybody ever had a problem and it's like somebody plays the video over and over again in your head? You lay there at bed. Has anybody ever laid in bed at night when you have problems and you rehearse the failure? And then you rehearse the failure. And then it's 11 o'clock and you're rehearsing the failure. And you're 12 o'clock. You've already gone through the scenario 14 times. And it's 12 o'clock and you're rehearsing the failure. And it's 1 o'clock in the morning and you're rehearsing the failure. And you're rehearsing it at 2 o'clock in the morning and 3 o'clock in the morning. Finally, there's some mercy at 4 and you're gone. <laughs> you know, that's just the way life is. It's all because of what this... This is a process here. So I strengthen myself. The only way I can strengthen myself is get out of myself and get at him. Amen. The only way I can put on the armor of God is I got to take what he says that will protect me and put it on. How do I put it on? Right there in my thinking process. The Bible makes it very clear. I didn't say this. The Bible says, you want to argue with me, say, argue with the Bible. The Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. You think you're a loser, a failure, you're not going to make it. Uh, the old life has got you down so bad. You will never be anything. It's all about what you're thinking up there, and it better be lined up with the Spirit of God. Because if it's not lined up with the Spirit of God, it's lined up with something else, which is called the flesh, and it'll bring you to destruction. Wait a minute, is everybody listening? Let's go on then. He says this in verse number 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. 
Man, that's, that, that tells you right there that if you put this on the right way, you'll be able to stand. You won't fall, you won't fail, you won't lose, you won't have to give up, you won't have to run, you can stand. Then he comes along in verse number 12, he says, do not wrestle, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers and against the rulers and darkness of this age and against spiritual hosts of wickedness and heavenly places, man. They know, that's not what I'm going to say to you because it's really good. They know from the garden that humans just have to change their thinking and they will lose. And the same attack that took place with Eve is the same attack that takes place with you every day. He hadn't learned anything new. Hadn't created some new assault. The Bible makes it very clear that your battle's not with flesh and blood, but with demonic activity. And that same thing, that serpent that approached Eve and got her off track thinking is the same thing that gets you off track thinking on the flesh side instead of the spiritual side. Same attack. In the garden... He was smart enough to see, wow, I just got the humans by getting them to think something contrary to what God says. And if I can do that throughout history, I will defeat every human on the planet. And that's your battle. Verse number 13 says it like this. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. How am I going to take it up? Mentally. Putting it on in my soul. I'm thinking about what God says, not what my flesh or the world or the people around me say. That you may be able to withstand in an evil day and doing done all, done all, when you've done it all, when you've done it all, don't tell me you've done a little bit. Tried it once and it didn't work. Little dab will do you. It doesn't work that way. you got to stay in this thing. Remember last week I said cast down imagination so that exalt themselves above the knowledge of God and bring it in every captivity, every thought to the obedience of Christ. 2 Corinthians 10th chapter, remember that? And you're going to have to get it. comes in, it's an evil thought, it's contrary to the ways of God. I've got to get rid of it and then I've got to cast it down. Then the second thing I've got to do is I've got to set my mind. I've got to set my mind not on the flesh but on the things of God. When I set my mind, so here's what I'm doing. I'm casting out what the flesh says. I'm setting my mind on what God says. Guess what? I'm now able to stand in that evil day. Is anybody listening? You say, Pastor, that's too hard. Well, the results are harder. The results is your family fails, you fail. You go back to drug world and you go back to the whore world, hooker world and all the places you came from. Going back to the gang world, going back to the beat up world and find yourself sucking mud in the gutter. Now that's hard. (sighs) Having done all to stand, stand. In other words, God didn't tell you to stand, just to sit down and give up, quit. Keep on standing. How do I do that? Right side. How do I fail? Left side. How do I keep on standing? Right side. Watch this. Then he comes along and says, stand therefore, having girded yourself with truth. You know what girding yourself with truth means? It means everywhere you go, God's word goes. That's what it means. Gird means you put a belt around. When I have a belt on, I have a belt on right now. Where I go, my belt goes. If I twist real fast, it twisted real fast. (laughs) If I jump up and down, it jumps up and down. Everywhere I go. Remember that? Remember that? Remember this, Chaplain? What was it? You used to do the twist, right? My, 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 my belt's girded with truth. So what he's really saying is like, I'm looking for some kind of belt of truth. I guess I'll get the Bible and I'll scotch tape it together and make a belt out of it. That's not what he's talking about, dumbbell. 
He's really talking about simply everywhere you go, you carry truth with you. How do I do that? Right side. Wait a minute. How do I carry the truth? Put up page 15. How do I carry truth with me everywhere I go? What side? Right side. Okay, go back to the verses. Ephesians. So we're putting on the whole armor of God. I've got to carry truth. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness. In other words, the breastplate of righteousness is something. My heart is where the breastplate is. So my heart now says, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I'm no longer a dirt bag. I'm no longer a failure. I used to be a loser, like Isaiah 43 said. I'm not thinking about the past. I'm thinking about the future. I used to be a child of the devil, but now I'm a king's kid. And when you got a king's kid, man, I tell you what, you got, you got, you got, uh, attitude and you got giftings and you got blessings waiting for you when you're a king's kid. Somebody ought to say amen. And, and how, do I, how, do I, how do I put on the breastplate that covers my heart of my position? Right side or left? Right. Every day. Then verse number 15 comes along. Verse number 15 says this. It says, and have my shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In other words, I got something everywhere I go. I carry peace and the gospel of the Lord. I carry peace with me. How do I carry that peace? I carry it at what side? Left side or right? Right side. Okay, remember, I'm, I'm putting on the whole armor of God every day. Why? Because I'm in a battle every day. Rocky Road ice cream is screaming at me. We say that to be fun, but you know, most of you know what I'm talking about, what screaming at you means. And then he comes along and he makes this statement, verse number says, above all, taking the shield of faith, which you're able to quench every fiery dart from the wicked one. Can I ask you a question? Where does a fiery dart go? And why would you want to quench a fiery dart? And what does that mean, holding up the shield of faith? The shield of faith means here's my faith shield. I believe it in God. And the devil is shooting fiery darts. Have you ever had a thought, hear me, that depressed you when you thought about it? And you went, oh my goodness, what if? Have you ever listened on the news lately and say, what if the whole country fails? What if Europe goes down? What if... I heard a rumor that I'm losing my job and right in your heart. I heard my husband is, I heard my wife is, those are fiery darts. Where do they go? They go in your heart, which is supposed to be covered by your righteous position because you're girded around by the belt of truth and you've got peace all the time. But in order to quench that fiery dart that wants to come in, now where does it come in? comes in your thinking. Put up page 15. The fiery dart is shot at what? At your Holy Spirit that's on the inside of you or the Spirit of God? No. It's fired at your what? Your soul, realm, your emotions, and your thinking. All of a sudden, this evil thought comes in, and it's like, bang! Knocks you off of your, off, and all of a sudden, if he can get you thinking about that fiery dart instead of thinking about the solution to the fiery dart, He's got you on the left side instead of the right side. So when he says, hold up the shield of faith, he's really saying, doesn't he? He said, stand faith in faith because everything that's going to be thrown at you that's going to try to get through to your mind that'll cause you to be down, depressed, discouraged, and frustrated. Oh, you know, reality is, you know somebody who tried that and failed. You know it doesn't work. How do you think this is going to work? Why do you think God likes you? He saw what you did last week. He doesn't like you at all. All those fiery darts that come in and try to stop you from being what God would have you do. The what, what, what quenches them? Faith. I believe God's greater, but God will take care of me. God will open doors that no man can open. God will close doors no man can close. See, and then we find ourselves understanding how this simply works. It's a, it's a mental thing, having a shot, and then it's taking up the, let's take a look at this one, verse number 17, and taking the helmet of salvation. What's the helmet of salvation? 
It's your mind. What's your helmet cover? Your thinking. You're saved. You're saved. You're different. Now the results of your life are going to be different. You've got God on the inside of you. You're saved. You're going to heaven. Jesus died for you. You're blessed people. How does that happen? Page 15. Up on the top again. Right side. My spirit now, I'm taking on the helmet of salvation. I'm thinking about my salvation. I got it. I don't have to go try to get it. I got it. Yeah. Verse number, if you will, 17 again. Look at what it says. And the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. How do I take on the sword of the spirit? I mean, I just wrap it around my neck. Do I put it uh, in my wallet? Do I put it in my pocket? Where, how do I carry with me the, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God? I carry it in my mind. Wherever I'm going, I'm thinking about what God says. I'm not thinking about, listen, I got lots of opportunities to think about what I feel. Lots of opportunities to think about what I see as logical, uh, uh, understand as practical. I mean, obviously this is what I should be doing, but the word of God says that's the sword of the spirit. And you are now cutting away everything. You'll hear more about that this weekend, but... It's an amazing thing. Verse number 18. Last thing you do is pray and don't pop up verse 18. He says, praying always with prayer and supplication. How do you pray? I mean, you're, you don't have to just sit down. Just pray all the time. You're thinking about God, talking to God. God, let me tell you something. God's the only one who knows what's in your mind. Did you know the devil can't read your mind? I can prove it to you. Did you know that most Christians think the devil can read their mind? Did you know that scripturally that's not true? The devil cannot read your mind. What the devil reads is your emotions. He sees the twitch in your eye. He sees the expression on your face. He knows just what you're thinking, where you're going, what you're doing. He can't read your mind. Proof of that is the book of Daniel. Here's Nebuchadnezzar, woke up with a dream, never told anybody about the dream. Got everybody in and said, okay, let's interpret this dream, but I'm not telling you what the dream is. You tell me what the dream is. And none of his soothsayers, none of his witchcraft people, none of his demonic people could tell him anything. Don't you think if Satan knew what the dream is, he would have told one of his cronies to tell him, here's what the dream is? Not a chance. Only Daniel was told by God what the dream was all about. He doesn't know what your mind is saying, so don't worry about it. What you need to know is that God does know what your mind is saying. He's the only one that knows what your mind is saying. The rest of them, your enemy is watching the expressions on your face, whether you're staring at that fruit long enough. She was looking at the fruit, and he said, mm, I got this girl. Is anybody listening? So today, and last time, I'm not talking about it anymore. I'm finished. You're either right side or left side. You know, the kids rise up and you want to choke them, yell, scream, and knock the snot out of them, and you haven't even left the church parking lot yet? <laughs> Everybody know what I'm talking about? You go like this, oh, thank you, Jesus, thank you. Shut up back there. Oh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> you know, it's true. it's true. I'll watch you out the window. <laughs> Oh, my God, we got a long ways to go in this place. <laughs> so here's the deal. The deal is you're either going to go right side or left side. When the husband's a jerk, how many realize, that ladies, don't move. <laughs> how many realize sometimes husbands can be a jerk? How about some of you men admitting it? I can be a jerk, totally a jerk. You know, Debbie's left side, we got a big fight. If Levy, Debbie's right side, we got it cool. Thank God she's a right-sided woman. See, so it's, 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 it's the way it is. You know, the boss is putting pressure on you, blames you for something else somebody else did. Now you hate the boss and the other guy. <laughs> you got to go right side. Or it won't be long before your left side and the left side causes you to do stuff you wish you hadn't done. And then you end up in death. Put up the page again. 
15. You're called. This is life. Life and peace. That was the promise from God, if you'll stay right side. You got to work at this. You got to practice it. You're not going to hear this one time, go home and do it forever. Because you will forget. Or you can go left side, brings you death. Your call, death in your marriage, death with your children, death as an older person in business, death in every area of your life. Right side, blessings, life, love, hope, light. Left side, death, lust, sin, desires, passion, unfulfilled. Your call. Nobody can make you do it. But in order to get you trained on the right side, you ought to be in church all the time, getting as much information as you can so you can in every situation stay right side. That's what a good church is all about. <laughs> it is, listen to me, it is not doing your penance before God. And you get in your brownie point. I went to church. I, get, I guess I get answered prayer. God could care less about that. You get into a church that's feeding you. And you get into a church that you can grow in. And you find out how to live life and have the peace that God paid for. Not the death that Satan wants you to get into. Come on. Come on, somebody. Listen, you can't get to heaven because you come to church. No. You cannot get to heaven because you're a nice person. Nope. You're never going to make it to heaven because you hope you're going to make it. Nope. You're not going to make it. You're not going to get in heaven because you're cool or kind or because you give your charity money or you take care of your neighbor. You're not going to make it. Somebody needs to tell you. Jesus a beaten, bloody mess, goes to the cross and dies for you. Listen to these words. Raised from the dead in the third day, seated at the right hand of the Father so that you can go to heaven. Do you think he would just leave it up to you, whatever you think, that'll get you there? You know, whatever they think is okay. And, ah, they have a little bit of a screwy idea, but I guess it's okay. I'll let them in heaven. I don't think so. He tells us exactly how to get to heaven in the scripture. You might say to me, Pastor Jim, hold on, hold on, Pastor Jim. My mom and dad told me I was a Christian when I was a kid. They had me christened or baptized when I was a baby. Put a cross or a St. Christopher around my neck when I was a child. Took me to catechism class or Sunday school or Sabbath school class when I was a child. But can I tell you something? Nowhere in the Bible, it's not in the Bible, it says that'll get you to heaven. You're not going to make it. Somebody needs to love you enough, respect you and honor you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. Jesus, who made this statement, and you need to hear it. Here's what he said. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, now watch the words, no man goes to the Father except by me. You can't get there any other way except his way. That's what Jesus said. No man goes to the Father except by me. You're going to have to get there his way, not my way, not some well-meaning church committee's way, and certainly not your way. And he tells us exactly in the scripture what is his way and how to get to heaven. You know what he says? John, third chapter. You must be born again. As soon as I use those words, born again, some of you turn off immediately. You know why you turn off? It's because you've been trained by Hollywood that born again people are idiots. Fools, radicals, and goofballs. Movies and mo magazines have told you that, books. But that's not what Jesus is talking about. Jesus made a statement. I want to tell you what born again really means from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. Here's what born again really means. It means you've given God all of your heart. It means you've given God all of your life. You see, it's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Always has been, always will be. All or nothing. God forgive us in American churches. We've watered that down for 250 years. All or nothing. I'll prove it to you. Last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. Jesus himself is speaking. He says, I'm coming again. 
And when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Do you know what he just really said? He really said that people that call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all and are going to get vomited from the mouth of Jesus. So let's define for you what lukewarm is. Is that okay? Lukewarm is someone that's like this, little in, little out. Little up, little down. Token prayer, occasional church attendance. You know, you're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. You know what I'm talking about. You're not against him, but you're not wholehearted for him. That's lukewarm. God is something in your life. Watch this. Here's lukewarm. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And tonight, you can make him everything by giving him all of your heart. You got to give it to him. Giving him all of your life. You got to give it to him. You know why you got to give it to him? Because he's not a thief to rob it from you. It's your heart and life. He's not a conniver to talk you out of it. He's not a manipulator to make you do it. He could if he wanted to. He gave you a free will choice, just like what you saw with Adam and Eve. You can either choose his ways or choose a different way. But it's your call, it's your choice. And tonight, many of you that are in this room, God spoke to you tonight about your life. But you haven't yet given God all of your heart. You haven't yet given God all of your life. And tonight is your night of salvation. And God brought you here. This is a divine, a divine appointment you have with God. Tonight is your night of salvation. Don't miss this. You say, Pastor Jim, how do I get right with God? Well, let's don't do it my way and let's don't get right with God your way. Let's get right with God God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll pop my hands together. Bang! As you hear that sound. Bang! Your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up. What you're saying by the raising of your hand is I don't want Jesus in my head like most Americans. I want to give him all of my heart, give him all of my life. Be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. You see, I already know you know who Jesus is or you wouldn't be here. I already know you celebrate Christmas every year and celebrate Easter every year of your life. I already know that. and You know it too. But having head knowledge about who Jesus is will not get you to heaven. We all have head knowledge. It's about what you've done with your heart. And tonight you're going to have to give him all of your heart. Tonight you're going to have to give him all of your life. I've done my job tonight. I told you the truth. Now you can walk on the left side and keep on going. Or you can switch now and go to the right side. And there's life and peace waiting for you. But you're going to have to make the commitment. You say, Pastor, wait a minute. You want me to raise my hand? I'll feel embarrassed if I raise my hand. People will see me behind me. People that I came with will see me. I'll feel funny. Yep, you will. Get over it. It's better to feel funny for a moment in a safe place like this than to be in hell forever and ever because you care more about what people think instead of what God sees. Tonight, it's your night of salvation all across this auditorium, back to the family rooms, wherever you're at. Get ready to pop your hands up. Where's the ushers that'll help me? to see whether or not there's any ushers in this place that can help me. Check out these family rooms for me. I want to see if there's anybody there that is going to raise their hand. I'm, I, I'm going to count to three. Get ready. You pop your hand up, put it right. Hold on. We'll do it all at the same time. Are you ready? Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five. Thank you. Back here. There's six. God bless you. Back on this side. There's seven. There's eight. God bless you. There's nine. Thank you. Anybody else? There's another one. Ten. Back over here. God bless you. There's eleven. Thank you. Back over here in the family room. There's twelve. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Real quick. Anybody else? There's twelve smart people. There's thirteen. There's Mr. Thirteen. Smart guy. Anybody else? Anybody else? There's Anybody else saying, I'm, I'm going right side. I'm going where God, I'm going for life. I'm getting off the left side. I'm tired of being on the left side. There's another 14. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? There's 14. Where are you? 15. You're sitting here right there. You're saying to yourself, I wonder if I should do this. Well, if that's you, you should. Anybody else? Anybody else? Thank you, 15. God bless you. Gotcha. Let's give the Lord a great big praise for 15 wise people. Here's what I want you to do. 
All 15 of you got to do this quick so I don't keep everybody too long. I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend. Get your stuff. Get out of your seat. Every one of you raised your hand. You're serious about God. I want you to get out of your seat. Get in the aisle. Meet me in front. All right. Are you ready? Even from the family rooms, bring your children. You can come. Let's stand and welcome them as they come. You raise your hand, get down here right now. Or if you should have, get down here. You can come too. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Lord, I give hurry, you hurry, my hurry, heart. hurry. I give you my soul. I'll live for you alone. Every breath that Come on, home. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Every moment I'm away. Give me a hand as they come. Come on. I give you my soul. Thank God, thank God, thank God you guys have come. Real quick, I want you all to look to your left. See this guy waving at you? His name is Pastor Dave. He's going to do three things. Pray with you to invite Jesus into your heart. Give you some free information, stuff you can take home and read about and then introduce you to a program we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. Oh, listen, parking lot's filled anyway, so you're not getting out for the next few minutes. Enjoy this time. It's a good thing. No weird stuff goes on. People you came with will wait for you. Make a left turn. Follow Pastor Dave right over there. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Isn't God good? 